Shabbat shalom. I'm excited to begin this series today. It's an exciting theme, obviously the tribulation, right? The, we're going to have four weeks in this series, and we're talking about Christians, Muslims, and Jews in the tribulation. Well, the first thing you ought to be thinking is, what do you mean Christians in the tribulation? Aren't they supposed to be out of here? <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about that next week. How about that? <laughs> now you have to come back. Right? You have to come back. <laughs> I didn't want to just jump into all of them pre-trib and post-trib and ex-trib and low, no trib and <laughs> pan-trib, right? Yeah, I've heard about that. I think that's a Texan doctrine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all pan out. It all pan out. <laughs> but today I wanted to talk to you about Jacob's exodus from trouble. Jacob's exodus from trouble. And you'll see uh, a play on words that I'm doing here. Um, so I thought about this series, first of all, because of the month of Elul. The month of Elul, which we are beginning next week, is a Hebrew month in which traditionally we prepare for the following month in which all the fall holidays fall, the month of Tishri. And so the month of Elul is it's a month-long preparation. We hear the shofar every day except on Shabbats. And the shofar is a call to repentance. So it is a preparation for the holidays, for, for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And we're going to teach, as we approach uh, the feast, I'm going to teach you before the feast. I'm not, I, I hate it when, 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 when rabbis or pastors, they teach about the feast on the day of the feast. And you're like, well, thanks. I needed to know that last week. <laughs> So I always teach a little bit ahead of time so that you know how to take this home and how to observe this at, uh, at home. But for the month of Elul, then I wanted us to, it, it, the moment that I began to consider what to teach for the month of Elul, then immediately it came to me. Let's talk about trials and tribulations because that's the, what in, in Jewish tradition, that's the association of this month. Obviously, as you are trying to seek repentance and return to the Lord, you're going to have some obstacles. And the enemy is not going to just let you, you know, waltz your way back to God in some of the areas that we need to return to the Lord. So, uh, so it is a, a time of trial and tribulation. So I thought, well, this will be appropriate. Um, to speak about the spiritual realities of the physical time. Uh, to, to trek along with the Jewish people in some of the same thoughts contained in this month. Um, but I also wanted to base this series on our vision as a congregation. So, little test for you. Do you know the vision of Sukkot Shalom? <laughs> You can find it in our website. That will be the easiest way to find it. You can go to sukatshalom.us and brush up. And for next week, when I ask you again, then you'll be raising your hand, right? <laughs> so the vision of Sukkot Shalom is to see a community of Jews and Gentiles experiencing, that's the verb, that's the key verb, experiencing three things. Experiencing Yeshua, Torah, and revelation for the end times. If you guys are looking for it on the screen, it's not there. <laughs> My bad. Good thought. I should have done it. <laughs> so the vision of Sukkot Shalom is to see a community of Jews and Gentiles experiencing Yeshua, Torah, and revelation for the end time. Now, I crafted this vision intentionally. He found it right there. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Good job, Matthew. Um, so I crafted this vision so that we can have a sense that we fulfill this vision every 
Shabbat, every week, every time that we meet, we are going to experience Yeshua. Did you experience Yeshua today? Yes. He's been all over this service today, right? Yes, the Spirit of God is here, exalting the Son and the Father. Amen. And we, we also have experienced the Torah. Not only in the Torah service, in the Torah study, in everything that we do, the foundation of the Word of God, we experience that. And then here comes this component, right? For us to experience revelation for the end times. Revelation for the end times. So this series is also based on very much who we are, on our vision as a congregation. Um, we, as a messianic movement, we are an end time prophetic and revival movement. That's who we are. That's how we were born. It is an end time revival movement of Jewish people coming to Yeshua and Gentiles coming to the roots of their faith to be established in Messiah for God's purposes in the end times. And that is what we pattern ourselves after as a congregation firmly rooted in this movement of God. It's a prophetic and revival end times movement. So my goal in this series is for us to receive practical revelation about the end times. That's our vision. To experience revelation. Revelation brings transformation. Doctrine and theology, they have their place. They lead to education. I myself believe in education. I'm getting ready to start my master's in biblical studies. But education does not lead to transformation. Only a revelation through the Spirit of God, of the Word of God, a, a coming alive of the truth jumping off the page to you. Only through these kinds of revelations are we transformed. We experience transformation. So my goal for this series is that we experience revelation in the area of prophecy, in the area of end times, and specifically regarding the tribulation. Why? So that we can be guided in our mission of discipling Jewish and Gentile believers in the Lord. Of making disciples who are firmly rooted in the Torah, Yeshua, and the end times. So we're going to derive practical revelation to guide the mission that we have as a congregation to disciple Jews and Gentiles. All right, so let's jump into this. We're going to go to Jeremiah 30. So in this first uh, message, we're going to talk about the nature of the tribulation as it, as it concerns to Israel. And the nature that we're going to see, the nature of the tribulation, is that it is a time of oppression it is, and it is a time of exodus. A time of oppression and a time of exodus. Therefore, I titled it, the Jacob's Exodus from Trouble, from Oppression. So Jeremiah 30, verse 4, it says, now, these are the words which the Lord God spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Uh, for thus says the Lord, for, for thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man? with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth. All right, right off the bat, this is funny. Is it not? Is it not? Right? This is, this is every woman's desire. Like, I wish you could experience this, buddy. <laughs> so you would know. <laughs> 
But you know, even Yeshua used this, this language, didn't he? He said the, the, basically the end times will be like birth pangs, right? The beginnings of birth pangs. So here the Lord is saying, listen, everybody is going to be in so much pain, it will be like men are giving birth. Um, and it says, you know, ask now and see if a male can give birth. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress. Or the time of Jacob's troubles. But he will be saved from it. He will be saved from it. It's funny because the church is the one that thinks that they will be saved from it. <laughs> But scripture says that Israel will be saved from it. But how? All right. So we're going to flirt a little bit with the tribulation issue, but we're not going to dive right into it, right? So we're going to prepare the stage for it next week. All right. So Deuteronomy 4.30. See, these are not passages that you would normally turn to when you are studying the tribulation. In Deuteronomy 4.30 it says, When you are in distress, and this word distress is the same word that we just read in Jeremiah 30. The same Hebrew word. So here the Lord is speaking to Israel through Moses and he says, When you Israel are in distress and all these things have come upon you. What things? The, curse, the blessings and the curses. The exile. The exile for almost 2,000 years. And when you have come back, he says, in the latter days. That's why we know this isn't just talking about the Babylonian captivity. This is talking about today. In the latter days. In the end times. Right now. So after all these things... Um, after you're in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days, I will return, oh, I'm sorry, you will return to the Lord, your, your God, and listen to his voice. You will return to the Lord, your God, and listen to his voice. Right from Deuteronomy, speaking of the end times, of the return of Israel, we know that in this prophetic word, there is an expansion that the Lord gives to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37. How Israel is restored to the land like a corpse put together. But there is a, a two-stage restoration. The physical restoration of the nation and then the spiritual. When the Lord says prophesy to the four winds. And breathe into this man like a corpse laying on the ground, which is Israel. Just like the way God created Adam and Eve. Adam actually originally. He formed him and then he breathed into him. That is, that is the same that will happen with Israel. Then Israel will hear the Lord's voice. Shema Israel. Right? Now we say the Shema. Then we will live the Shema. We will live the Shema. Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31.10. Because this particular passage that we just read in, in Deuteronomy really is the foundation of the new covenant. So we go back to Jeremiah 31 verse 10. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. I love this little passage. Before we jump into the new covenant, which is going to be in verse 31, as you, as, as you know, this is the Jeremiah 31, 31, speaking of the new covenant. Before we do that, I found this address to the nations, to the Gentiles, to non-Jewish believers. 
that is quite fascinating right here in Jeremiah because it says in Jeremiah 31.10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, O goyim, O Gentiles, and declare in the coastlands afar off. So the Gentiles are the ones who are going to hear and the Gentiles are the ones who are going to declare. All right. What are they going to declare? It says, and say, verse uh, 10, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. The Lord is the one who restores Israel. We see it. We support it. It isn't just a proclamation, you know, like a doctrinal statement. This is something that comes out of believers' core, out of who they are. We believe in the God of Israel, and we believe in the restoration of the people of Israel. Amazing. But this is going to happen in the context of Israel's restoration and preparation for the new covenant. So this proclamation by the nations comes at a high price. It's easy to proclaim doctrine, theology, even belief. But to proclaim core values at gunpoint in the tribulation, under the threat of persecution, that's different. That is going to refine the church. It is going to to purify the body of Messiah. This is what what we read of in Matthew 25, where the Lord will come and judge the nations, not Israel. He will judge the nations, how they treated Israel in the tribulation. Kind of like Gentiles who hid and protected Jews during the Holocaust at a very high price, risking everything, and some lost their lives. This is not a small thing. It's not a small role in the play. And it comes with a high reward. Verse 11, it says, For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of him who, has, who was stronger than he. Remember, This is speaking of the end times. This is speaking of the Antichrist. The Lord has ransomed, has redeemed, purchased back. This is is the Exodus. This is Exodus language. Just like God redeemed Israel out of Egypt, he will do it again. Verse 31, Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What does after those days mean? You see, that points to the end times. After all of these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curses. Uh, After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my Torah within them. And on their hearts, I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember 
no more. The new covenant. The promise made to Abraham. Finally coming to full fruition. What we have today is a foretaste. But the full meal is still awaiting. Because this is a covenant made with the house of Israel. And Gentiles have come in, come in through Yeshua as a foretaste of that covenant. Israel will be persecuted in the end times. The question is, or the, the, the issue to discern in that persecution is whether Israel is persecuted because of their sin or not. And the, the way that I, that I found to compare this is to compare it to King David's distress. Because King David uses the same word. And he says that the Lord has delivered him out of all his distress. Same, same word as the time of Jacob's distress. But you see, King, King David was persecuted by Saul without a cause. So persecution and tribulation and distress is not necessarily an indication of a sinful lifestyle, of judgment coming upon you from the Lord. The apostles suffered great persecution precisely because they were walking with the Lord. And that is going to be the case of Israel in the tribulation. You can say, well, Israel has their gay pride parade. Hello, isn't that sin? Sure. It doesn't mean you're not sinful. It doesn't mean that David was not sinful. <laughs> but you see, you have to discern the times. The Lord is long-suffering. The Lord did not send Israel into captivity until for over 400 years. Of sending prophet after prophet after prophet. And how all has Israel been in existence as a modern day nation? 70 years. The Lord is just starting with his love and his patience toward Israel. The persecution that will come upon Israel. Coming out of the dragon. Coming out of the false prophet and coming out of the beast is without a cause. And because of that, the redemption will be swift. Three and a half years. That's quick. The Lord will come and redeem Israel. Just like he redeemed Israel out of Egypt. How did he do that? Let's read quickly in Revelation chapter 16. Verse 1, Revelation 16, 1. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So we've had the trumpets, the seals, and now the seven bowls. This is approaching the end. Verse 2 it says, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome, loathsome and malignant sore. This is the same that happened on Egypt. Uh, on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. That's the first bowl. Sores on the, sore on the people. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. This is not now just the, the river of Egypt. This is worldwide. Just like Egypt. You see the theme here. 
This is the theme of Exodus. The best book that you can study in preparation for you to understand Revelation is actually Exodus. Exodus is that thoroughly prophetic book. Because just like it was in the Exodus, so it will be in the end times. Verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. So we'll, we'll jump over to verse 8 for the sake of time. But we see now all of the water, not only the seas, but the, but the rivers and everything became blood. Verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. So they're suffering these plagues just like Egypt suffered the plagues, and said, no, we will not let your people go. This is the same attitude in the end times. Verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river the Euphrates, and its water dry, uh, was dried up. This is also like the Exodus, right? The Lord dried up the Red Sea, the, Re the Sea of Reed, for Israel to cross. But this is a reversal. This is now the enemies of Israel to come and invade Israel. This is like Pharaoh coming after Israel, taking advantage that the Lord had parted the waters, to come after Israel. And they're going to suffer. These guys are going to suffer the same fate. Because they crossed the Euphrates. Who do you think is coming through the Euphrates? People say it's China. Friends, the, one who live, the ones who live in the Euphrates are Muslims. <laughs> the whole river is full. It's all 100% Muslim. So we'll get into this uh, in the coming weeks. Verse 17, let's jump down again. It says, then the seventh angel, now this is the seventh bowl, the last one. The seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. It is done. Verse 18. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to, came to be upon the earth. So great, so great an earthquake was it and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. When we move into chapter 17 and chapter 18, then we see this judgment upon Babylon. Coming out of the seventh bowl. So the seventh bowl extends to chapter 17, to chapter 18, and it actually goes into chapter 19. Because in chapter 19, the Son of God descends on a white horse. To bring judgment upon those soldiers that crossed from the Euphrates and came all the way through Syria, through Iraq, through Syria, through Lebanon to come and, and gather together at the valley of Har Mageddon to come and invade the city of Jerusalem. All of that is the seventh bowl, the coming of Yeshua. That's why it says it is done when the, when the seventh bowl is poured over. All of this 
is the Lord delivering Israel out of the hands of the Antichrist in an Exodus-like manner. Coming in, striking down the, oppress the oppressor to deliver the oppressed. This is the nature of the tribulation. We've touched on Muslims. We've hinted about Christians. But this is a time of Jacob. This is a time of Israel's redemption. It's not the time of punishment. It is a time of Israel's coming into world prominence. This is how it starts. So how do we get on board with what God is doing today? You see, the end time will see a revival. A revival led by Israelis. Led by Jewish people. You are already in line with what God is doing. As a congregation, we are lining ourselves up to strengthen and, and empower this move of God that will culminate in the prominence of Israelis worldwide. Just like America has been the prominent and dominant power in the world for a hundred years, Israel will be so for a thousand years. People will not seek to learn English online. They will seek to learn Hebrew in Israel. <laughs> they will come. The nations will come. Every year. You realize they're coming because they want to. They're not commanded to. Although they're threatened if they don't. But the commandment, the co yeah, what kind, of, what kind of suggestion is that, right? Uh, the, command, the commandment is for Jewish men to go up to Jerusalem three times a year. But now it reveals the heart of God that it was his, in, his desire was for, the, for all the nations to really come. Not, not just Israel. And we are in the, in, the, in the early stages of this development of what God is doing in the world right now. Of bringing Israelis and Jewish people to a place of prominence. We are part of building this. Some of us as Jews, some of us as Gentiles. As we read, the nations will proclaim... We believe in the God of Israel. He is restoring Israel. We're part of this. We're financing this. We're praying for this. We're building this revival. And that's what we're doing strategically as a congregation. We're lining ourselves up to strengthen the movement of the body of Messiah in Israel. And here in our in our. Jerusalem, right? In our local city, we fight for the salvation of Jews and for the, the harvest of non-Jews. That they will come to build this, this vision and this destiny that the Lord has. We can fulfill our mission and our vision without revelation about the end times because the revelation of the end times informs who we are and what we do and how we do it today amen amen hallelujah praise the lord let's pray father we thank you we thank you for speaking to us loud and clear in a gentle in a fatherly voice, in an encouraging tone for those of us who are here who have said yes to this calling, who are getting on board with 
what you are doing in the world today. We pray, we pray not only for Israel, but we pray for Israelis who need to come to know you. For those who have already come to know you, who need to be discipled, need to be free, need to learn how to worship you. Help us to have a part in what you're doing. In Yeshua's name. Amen.